before we move to Shelley to your section, I think we have another poll. And okay, so again, I hope you can all see that poll asking what is your default approach to managing a CKD or heart failure patient with a potassium of five or more. Um, just going back to that that slide that I showed you that actually um, whether it is a potassium of five or 5.5, that's still an independent predictor of, of poor outcomes that we talked about. Okay, so let's talk about a CKD or heart failure patient with hyperkalemia. What would you do in your real world practice? Um, would you reduce or stop the RASI therapy temporarily? Would you start the potassium binder or would you just keep an eye on it a little bit more closely? So is it A, stop or reduce the, the RAS inhibitor, start a potassium binder, or just keep a closer eye on things? So let's see what's coming through on the poll result. Um, so that again is really, really interesting in just how close the split is. And I think this probably represents our real world practice in, the, in that we have all done all of these things at some point for people that we have seen like that. Um, and I guess that's going to lead very nicely uh, into Shelley's presentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Shelley at this point. Well, thank you so much and um, great poll questions. I'm thinking back to your poll or first poll question, James. I think I'm team 5.5 for action in real life. And then based on, and it, it depends on how you interpret this last poll question as well. For potassium around five, I suspect most cardiologists would just look closer rather than uh, take any action. So follow along to make sure it's not going up to those spurious levels where you have to take acute action or if it's chronically elevated over time um, where you have to think about strategies like novel potassium binders. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, encourage you to, to look at hyperkalemia in your real world practice um, and uh, provide you with some data to fight that clinical inertia as well and to avoid down titration of RASI therapy. Um, so again, international guidelines, both, and, and you're going to be seeing some of these today, both in the cardiology world particularly in the heart failure world and the Cadigo guidelines, all recommend up titrating RASI therapy to target recommended doses. And can we do that in real life? Well, not necessarily. I'm gonna show you here on this next slide here that the frequency of hyperkalemia is actually quite prevalent in patients with heart failure on the bottom row and in patients with chronic kidney disease. Almost 30% of them um, have an episode of hyperkalemia. And so again, that's a common clinical issue that we deal with every day. But what I think is interesting as well is that just like hospital admissions and heart failure patients, the, the gap between these hyperkalemia episodes narrows over time. So hyperkalemia is often going to recur in the same patient. So you do need to monitor it or think about a long-term management strategy for it. And same holds true for CKD. And if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that these patients who have an indication for RASI therapy are not necessarily um, being exposed to it as frequently or as much as they should be. Now, they could have other reasons why they were not on RASI therapy, but hyperkalemia, as you can see, occurs in 30%. Um, others may have issues with EGFR and or um, blood pressure as a reason not to prescribe. But hyperkalemia is a very pertinent barrier to up titration or continuation of RASI therapy. Now, this is the slide I was speaking to in terms of the impressive reductions in mortality and MACE. On the left-hand side, you see those patients with CKD. The gray bars uh, re uh, 
represent, pardon me, those who have received less than 50% of guideline recommended RASI dose, whereas the dark green bars you can see result in a substantial reduction in mortality and MACE when you achieve higher than a 50% of that target dose. So it really does matter. And that's why our international guidelines in both CKD and in heart failure, look at the substantial reductions in mortality and MACE on the right-hand side of the slide for heart failure patients. So again, reasons why clinical inertia should be avoided, reasons why we need educational sessions like this to fight clinical inertia and, and encourage patient, or, or, uh, pardon me, care providers to up-titrate these therapies to reduce future risk of mortality and MACE in our shared patient populations. Now, this is uh, a paper by Cecilia Lind, uh, who is on the European Heart Journal editorial board. She's one of the deputy editors. Uh, and so uh, this is a really interesting paper showing how the level of potassium on the top side here, um, uh, top bars, you see a uh, potassium level of six and the resultant down titration and discontinuation rates are obviously higher with higher levels of hyperkalemia but they still persist in the moderate levels and in the lower levels of potassium um, around five. So, uh, and on the left-hand side on uh, the section A are, are those patients uh, with a diagnosis of heart failure and CKD is represented um, on the right-hand side. So again, discontinuation or down titration of RASI after an episode of hyperkalemia is prevalent in both of these patient populations. And based on the slide I just showed you, that has significant clinical implications and prognostic implications for that patient sitting in front of you. And in real world, uh, in, in uh, patients with hyperkalemia, 76% of patients were not reintroduced to MRA therapy during the subsequent year. Uh, and this is really one of the key components of our four foundational therapies in HEFREF. And actually, based on the data on finerenone, uh, which is also an MRA associated with less hyperkalemia, but does cause hyperkalemia nonetheless, this is going to be very relevant as well in the albuminuric CKD patient population. Um, so we really share these challenges with regards to MRA. Um, and when patients are taken off, uh, RASI therapy, they're off RASI therapy for a long period of time, potentially even longer in the kidney population, 2.4 years, whereas it's closer to two years in patients with heart failure before somebody looks at rechallenging them so that they have this prognostic benefit from being exposed to this disease modifying therapy. Again, I showed you Professor Lin's. Uh, data on the frequency of down titration and discontinuation in patients with heart failure and CKD based on the threshold level of potassium. And this really demonstrates for you the mortality impact of doing so. Now you can see on the, um, the green here on the left-hand side of each of these figures represents the maximal dose of RASI therapy, but by discontinuing uh, on the right-hand side, the, the bright green bar, where with down titrating RASI therapy dose in the purple bars, you can see that there's a significant impact on mortality in that patient population. And in fact, there are similar mortality rates between those who were down titrated and those who were discontinued treatment. So subtle differences, but really significant difference in comparison to being on the maximum dose of RASI therapy. Um, and that occurs in patients with moderate CKD, heart failure, and even in patients with diabetes who are also prone to hyperkalemia. And then I think I want to end with some encouragement as well, particularly in, in HEF-REF, when we look at prescribing our four foundational therapies, 
there are elements of those four foundational therapies that are associated with less hyperkalemia. So for instance, the cubitril valsartan is associated with less hyperkalemia than traditional ACE or ARB. This may, in fact, by switching a patient from ACE or ARB to secubitril valsartan, may allow you to uptitrate MRA. But nevertheless, you may still get hyperkalemia and it needs to be monitored and watched. And in addition, those patients who were randomized to SGLT2 inhibitors in clinical trials were shown to have less incident hyperkalemia and require less potassium binders as well. Um, and the use of SGLT2 inhibitors thus may allow for more uptitration of secubitril valsartan or MRA. So there is a, you know, opportunity for some of these newer contemporary HEFREF therapies to enable uptitration, maybe less hyperkalemia, but in all of our clinical practice, we would still continue to monitor as well. So these are some of our traditional hyperkalemia treatment options, which sort of in the armamentarium of most cardiologists and their interdisciplinary teams, we talk to patients about lowering the potassium. We sometimes uptitrate the diuretic in patients as well if they have room to move on their volume assessment. Of course, traditional potassium binders are really not well tolerated by patients especially long-term use as a management tool. Um, I've had patients push back consistently because of the GI side effects of these drugs. And we have some data as well with regards to gut erosions, which is concerning as well. And the last thing that we want to do is discontinue disease-modifying therapy or lower the dose of disease-modifying therapy if the patient is otherwise tolerating their RASI therapy. So I think, you know, today is an opportunity for us to discuss how novel potassium binders will enable the use of RASI therapy in our patient population when we're stuck with the other options of discontinuing and impacting the prognosis of our patient um, or uh, reducing the dose again, another step that we want to avoid as much as possible. So James, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we can begin our panel discussion again. Yeah, we've got, uh, so there's a couple of discussion points, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna first of all, I'm gonna pick up on one of your slides that um, I, I just think is encapsulates what this is all about. And it's that, first of all, that the whether you down titrate or, or discontinue them, the outcomes are still bad for both. But the time that it takes to reintroduce uh, reintroduce a RAS inhibitor or, or optimize therapy for individuals uh, after they've been down titrated. And I think you said 2.4 years for people with CKD. Why, why do you think it takes so long? So these are people that we already know. They've already been identified as individuals who really need these therapies. How, why is it taking so long to put people back on them? You know, I, I think that we need like check boxes at every patient um, interaction that we have. Um, and just to say, you know, are they on these disease modifying therapies? We see this um, with other forms of disease modifying therapy in, in HEFREF patients as well. Um, part of it is being exposed to subspecialty teams that are more likely to up titrate um, and, and add in these medications. Uh, we know that, for instance, in uh, community cardiology and internal medicine offices, patients are less likely to be reintroduced or introduced to these forms of the four foundational therapies for HEFREF in comparison to heart failure um, clinics where there are interdisciplinary teams, more structured algorithms, more checkbox protocols present to make sure that every opportunity is taken to reintroduce these disease modifying therapies. So I think that that's like a big challenge is exposure to these more specialized teams um, that have these yeah. care pathways and algorithms in place. And I guess, uh, Clara, we alluded to it earlier, but 
I, I think so. My wife works in primary care, and I think there's this feeling that if a, if the hospital stops a medication, if a specialist team stops a medication, that there's a feeling perhaps that a non-specialist team or a primary care team there's a reluctance to restart it if it's been stopped by a specialist. Do you think that there's perhaps an element of it is communication between teams? I think that you have mentioned a very important point and um, is the multidisciplinary teams and better communication and assist assistential uh, routes. Because uh, as Shelley has told us, if you stop a treatment uh, two or three years in those kind of patients in which the mortality at five years achieves uh, 50%, uh, you are reducing a lot uh, the survival of our patients. So we know that hyperkalemia is a killer. It's a silent killer. She has shown us that it's a recurrent killer and we have fear. So if we do not uh, present these clinical cases in multidisciplinary teams with nephrologists, primary care, primary care, also the emergency department doctors, because uh, they receive the acute hyperkalemia, internal medicine doctors, cardiologists. Uh, I think uh, um, we have to, to, to do multidisciplinary uh, meetings, webinars, and uh, committees to present that cases, not to, to stop so long that treatments, because this is a real, real bad clinical practice that we have to reflect about and to make a debriefing about uh, why are we uh, doing that and we, what are we uh, stopping so 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 many times? How much time uh, that medications that are uh, the really modulators of uh, our life, the life of our cardiorenal patients? Yeah, I think we've all used that term, modulators of therapy, and I think that is really important. Andrew, I know that you you sit and you do clinics between primary and secondary care and you do clinics between uh, renal medicine and cardiology so I guess what's your perspective then on on the barriers to optimizing uh, those therapies so I'm think... going to come back I think I'm probably going to give the same answer to so many of the questions you asked me which is I think a lot of it is about ill inf poorly informed clinicians across the whole network because patients or people with heart failure, CKD, diabetes, go to all different places for their care. They'll go to the emergency room, they'll go to their GP, they'll go to their cardiologist, they'll go to their diabetologist, they may see a specialist nurse here. They see a whole range of people and no one really takes ownership. And I I liked what Shelley described about each point you need to have a checking point what is the person being treated with is that what they need to be treated with is that treatment optimized if not why we almost have to do that automatically for every consultation every contact and then we as the clinician the doctor the nurse the specialist nurse or the specialist pharmacist need to explain to the patient why we're doing it so that the patient the person understands as well and I think there's a huge piece of work around education, information, and removing um, these this clinical inertia. Um, and I do take your point about stopping therapy. I think it's often stopped in as an, what's called as an emergency without any real thought as to what the strategy should be. Why did this emergency occur? What can we do to reduce the chance of it occurring in the future? How are we going to get that person back on their optimised therapy? And I think it is a duty, the emergency care team, not just to firefight and deal with that in such isolation, but to actually say, what are we going to do or advise this person when they go back into primary care or secondary care? 
I think that's key, isn't it? You know, we've got to signpost our colleagues as to, you know, as specialists uh, with plans to reinitiate therapies and to help them to feel enabled to do that. I think we do have a duty to do that. Shelley, you, you mentioned about phenarinone. Um, you know, we don't, it's not just one new therapy that's, that's coming into town for, for, for CKD and diabetes. And, and heart failure in the SGLT2 inhibitors, but we also have phenarinone that is now, you know, great for people with diabetes and kidney disease. It's an MRA. We know they're great for heart failure. So the, the landscape is changing. It's changing quick. Do you think that as cardio renal metabolic practitioners, because I guess we see people with all of those conditions, are we, it's a bit of a segue into the next talk. Are we good at getting that roadmap together? And, and moving in the same direction and being unified in what we say? Hmm. Well, I think we're learning a lot from each other. For instance, most cardiologists until the past two years or so really didn't recognize UACR as a risk factor for um, cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. So there's been lots of knowledge translation between the groups to um, improve outcomes. I think, you know, we also have some clinical trial data as well to support, um, you know, the use of novel potassium binders for the optimization of MRA after the diamond trial uh, with Petirmer. We have Realize K coming downstream with for sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. Um, so I think we have to do a lot more in terms of knowledge translation and awareness for the trial data and the safety data that supports the approach that we're talking about today. There's a lot more that needs to be done.